All right. Hello, my name is Alicia Abrath, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about video documentation. But first, I wanted to ask you a few questions so I can understand where everybody is coming from with this topic. Um, so, is there anybody who's already doing some form of video documentation? It could be screen cams, it could be, you know, anything. Okay, so for about half of you. Um, is there anybody who, in addition to documentation, is involved in content marketing, writing blog posts, doing sales videos, or anything other kind of? Oh, okay, surprising. Um, so, I work at ThoughtSpot, and um, I'm involved in documentation and training mainly. But in the early days, I also worked a little bit in content marketing, so I have some examples from that as well. Um, one of my big questions was, what does it really take to do these different kinds of videos? So I'm going to share with you, you know, the people that were involved in them, the cost, you know, really details, so you can know what it takes to produce the different types. So how did I get into video documentation? Uh, well, I actually have a BA in radio, TV, and film. I'm the least educated person I know um, from the <laughs> University of Maryland. Um, I also worked right after college at the Federal Judicial Center doing training videos for the federal courts for about like five years. Um, so I was looking for <laughs> through YouTube, they're on YouTube now, and I saw this hilarious cameo of my 22-year-old self <laughs> playing a juror. So if you ever are a federal juror, you will see some of the videos that we produced back in the day. Um, this was in the 1990s, so um, actually my next job, surprisingly, was as a multimedia specialist at Oracle. And how I got that is because we had um, an SGI machine, so I was the, I had to learn <laughs> enough Unix to be the administrator of that machine, and it was enough to get a job at Oracle, because back then not many people knew multimedia, so they were hiring video people to do it. Um, and then after that, I was a sales engineer for Docent, uh, which became Sun Total. So it was a training company. Uh, they sell like online training systems, LMSs. Um, then I had twins. So that, uh -huh. unlike some executives in Silicon Valley, that took me out for about three years. And I didn't take only two weeks. It took me for several years um, before I could get back. And then um, I came back to work. Um, now unable to travel, so I had to pivot and I uh, went into documentation. So that's how I got into documentation um, at, at Aster, and which was bought by Teradata in 2011. So the awesome thing about my job now, I work at ThoughtSpot, um, is that I have a, this wonderful convergence. So anybody who's been working for some years and has changed jobs as often as I have, you know, you're always looking for that thing where you can bring all those skills back together again. So I was really excited um, at this job to be able to start working with video again a little bit um, in addition to documentation. So that's been just a ton of fun. So where to start with video production? Um, the most important video production tools, I think, are Google Docs and Google Sheets. Um, because if you have enough money, even with one person and those two things, you can make some awesome videos. And I'll show you one that um, our, our director of product, marketing, uh, product management made when he was in marketing that's totally awesome. Um, it took a lot of money, but really he used these two tools to make that video um, mm -hmm. and a lot of consultants outside help. So I'll t tell you about that and also about like, even for anyone when you're getting started, you know, initially you're going to start with a plan and probably a mm -hmm. script. So those are what you'll use. You um, need a video camera? You know, I'm not going to talk that much about video cameras, but if you have questions, I can talk about that too. Um, you know, I don't have one actually. We have been mostly doing screen cams and um, outsourcing for that type of production. But um, I would recommend Wistia, I'll talk a little about them later for training on that. They have like awesome free learning videos on their website. You can learn absolutely everything you need to learn to get started from zero mm -hmm. uh, from them. So, you know, like anything, you know, obviously you don't just sit down and write documentation. Usually you have some kind of a strategy or a plan. Um, you want to know, you know, just like with written docs, you want to know first, you know, what personas am I writing for? What are their goals? What are they trying to do uh, in the product that they can't do without documentation? Um, what are we doing now? What's not working about that? Where could it be better? You know, in my case with ThoughtSpot, we were not doing anything because when I started, there were like 20 people, so there was no doc. But, um, you know, so, but you want to look if there's already some existing materials. Um, what is the frequency of people accessing that content? If they're accessing it a lot, you want to make sure it's available where they need it and that, um, that they're able to easily access it and find stuff. 
Um, so the different modes of delivery, so different types of videos, what would be the best type for this particular um, you know, use case or problem? Do, should it be a screen cam? Should it even be an animation? I mean, these things surprisingly can be quite easy to produce. Um, if they fit what the user is trying to do, sometimes you might want to think outside the box a little bit about what mode you want to use. What resources do you have available? How much money? How much time? How many people can work on this? You know, what skills do they have? And then it may be helpful, especially if you're at a startup, to develop some sort of framework or some sort of approach to how you're going to do video. Um, so I'll talk about the approach we took. Um, so you know, we've learned a little bit since then. This is the approach we drafted about two years ago, and um, you know, since then we've the team has grown. We've hired more people, so we're able to do a little more, but. We had to make choices because in the early days it was just me, so I had to decide like where am I going to put my effort. Um, so I'll talk about how I made that assessment. So this is the gargantuan spreadsheet that we um, laid out that just has on the left hand side the different roles we were trying to address. So what ThoughtSpot does is um, we do business intelligence with a search interface. So it's basically like Tableau with a Google search bar on top and you type words and it starts building reports. It's pretty cool. Um, but our end users are not people that necessarily understand databases. Um, they don't necessarily understand that when they're typing in the box, a query is being issued and there are join paths and all this crazy stuff going on, sort of behind the scenes. So um, we try to make it simple for them. And so the role, two of the most important roles for us were business users and executives who don't usually use reporting tools directly. They usually pose their question to an analyst who then writes the reports. So you know, we were like, how are we going to? help these people learn, because they're not typically used to re reading documentation. Um, and they probably don't have a lot of tolerance for it, especially if it's supposed to be Google-like, and you know, then now you're telling me I need to read a document, right? So um, what we decided to do, um, you can see over here under, so we, we wrote down all the different modalities we might pursue, you know, including PDFs, video snippets, and so on. Um, and we decided that for those business users and executives, we're not going to write any doc at all. <laughs> Initially, we wrote nothing for them. It, we just did videos. And we wanted to keep them short and engaging and use that as the primary way to communicate to those types of users. You know, clearly for um, you know, the IT administrator, the um, data modeling person, for those people, we did regular mm -hmm. documentation. So this was version one of what, how we decided to approach it. We decided that for the end users, they would only get videos and in-product help. So they would get um, sort of like keyword help that, to answer the question, what can I type in the bar? You know, so some places in the product, we would give like some minimal sort of documentation. Um, and then for the business analyst, they would have a mixture of videos and written docs. Administrators would have written docs only. Um, we decided to use Dita for the written documentation only because I didn't use it at my prior job and I experienced the pain. <laughs> And I was like, I'm never doing that again. I have to learn this and, and get to know it. So, um, so we used Dita for all the written documentation. Um, <coughs> we wanted it all to be available either online or in PDF. So again, like to have that single source was like really important to us. Um, we wanted the videos to be available online, but because the company was still in stealth mode, we wanted them to be like behind a login so that people would not be able to see them, uh, you know, if they didn't access them either by logging in or through the product directly. Um, so it was awkward too because the you know security through obscurity approach was rejected. <laughs> so I was like, well how about if we have URLs but they're just not Google index? And everyone's like, no, we can't let anybody see it. You know, so and I think a lot of startups have this feeling that what they're building is so unique, they can't let anybody know about it. So that becomes an issue and we struggle with that a little bit um, trying to figure out how to address that and I'll talk about what we decided to do, you know, what we found to do for that. Um, we also wanted the videos to be really short, just one to two minutes each, so kind of the length of a topic in Dita. Um, because, you know, although on the one hand, if you want to learn the product from scratch, you're watching 600 videos and it gets kind of messy, we thought and hoped that for the most part people could figure out how to use the product on their own and they would just be looking for a specific how do I do, you know, how do I get the pie chart or something like that. Um, and then we wanted everything to be searchable together. So the searchable thing was super important to us because our product is based on search. If people had trouble searching in the doc, it would reflect very poorly on the, the product, even though it's not our search driving the doc search, if that makes any sense. So um, we wanted to make sure people could search the video 
the you know the words in the video and the words in the documentation at the same time. It's hard if you don't let Google look at your docs. It's uh, th there is a solution, which there is an imperfect solution, which I will talk about. So, um, if you write in Dita, you probably think of a lot of things in the framework mm -hmm. of Dita, um, as I was, especially because I was learning it uh, at that time. So, I decided that the best way to approach would be to have for concepts where we're trying to explain an idea, we would use animations. Um, for for procedures where we're like you know do this do that, we would use screen cams seems obvious but um, and then for written documentation we only uh, for references we only use the written documentation because obviously you know it's probably the least fitting for video okay then you know just like documentation we made a production plan um, this particular one was not the first one this is um, when we decided to add a help center within our product we wanted that to also have documentation and video in it. So this is the production plan for the components of that in-product help. Um, and by this time I had a designer to work with and I had a, another writer, so it was like a little easier to do more stuff. So um, you, know, you can see on the format, some things in the help center were HTML, some were screen cams. Um, we actually have a, did a concept video that was an animation. Um, you know, so just like anything else, you'll organize it and figure out what you need to do and where are the gaps and you know, do I have to hire someone? Can I outsource some of it? All that same kind of decisions. I suffer a little more because video being more resource intensive, if you haven't had to do that with written docs, you may have to start doing that with video. Okay, and so then I just, <laughs> because I'm old enough to have appreciated David Letterman, I did the top 10 pitfalls of video documentation. So these are things that um, surprised me a little bit, even though having done video, um, I'd never tried to apply it really to documentation. So these were things that were like kind of horrifying at first. Um, some of them have good answers, some don't. Um, so number 10, it takes longer to produce than written documentation. It just <coughs> takes longer. Um, it's harder to distribute. So with a written doc, you know, you can mail someone a PDF if all else fails, but with a video, you know, they have to have some way to listen to it. They may have to have, a, you know, nowadays a high enough bandwidth to receive streaming video is not as much of a problem as back in the day. Um, you know, they don't have to have necessary browser or plugins and stuff, but you do have to think about, you know, how am I gonna get this to them and how are they gonna find the right one? Um, I love the Oxygen video documentation, but every time I hire a new person, I'm like, Okay, here are these 50 videos. Mm -hmm. Three or four of them really apply to us, the rest don't. I can't remember which ones they are. You know, let's look through the list together. Like, it's just totally silly, right? So, um, yeah, but, you know, so they have to be able to find it. Um, video is harder to translate. In many cases, you have to translate the visual, you know, with the translated application. You'll have to redo the video, and you may not know where to click to get that link because you don't speak Japanese. Um, so you know that even translation, you might even have to outsource for translation. So it can get expensive if you want to translate it. Um, it and you know, and you need to hire a voiceover person that speaks that language, right? So it's pretty involved. Um, there is a different skill set needed. So you may on your team, you may not have people that already know how to make good video. Um, the, the number six, the equipment can be intimidating and all the software, it can be expensive and you may not know how to use, like now when I hire people, I have to teach them like four or five different software packages. Well, luckily there's video documentation for this. So usually they're able to self teach, but, um, but it's a big <coughs> learning curve. Um, number five, we don't know what works, right? So we have experimented with a lot of things um, in video documentation, some of which have worked really well and some of which have worked less well. Um, but I've been fortunate to have been able to give my team a lot of freedom to experiment. So, um, so we've learned a lot and we've done some fun stuff, you know, some of which we did when we had two or three customers and it was okay, but you know, now we're feeling like we have to grow up a little bit. But, um, so let's see, potentially more revisions. Um, whenever something changes in the product. So with documentations, like for me, I kind of just wait till the last minute. I have to admit it. I mean, I don't know if anyone else does that, but um, because then the product's stable, you know, and I, like the icon's not gonna change usually, hopefully. Um, but, you know, 
it's, it affects videos too. It's little changes like that can make you have to do a lot of revisions. It's harder to update than written documentation. Um, so, you know, at least you don't have like the typo problem as often, you know, it's, but you know, even if you have to update, like they change the name of a link in the product or something, um, it's not like you can just change a word. You have to typically, you know, re-record some of that audio and somehow make it match. Um, because of that, we use in-house voiceover. I almost never hire just because I want to be able to modify and fix that video later if something in the product changes. Um, it can have a short shelf life, again, because of something in the product changes. Um, also, people number one reason, number one bad, difficult thing about video documentation is people watch it. Um, so, <laughs> so you may be wondering, why is that so terrible? Is that a bad thing that people watch it? Well, it's challenging because the benchmark for quality in video is television. And I don't have a million dollar studio and I don't have like a $500 shotgun mic. So, my, you know, my video is never going to look like television, but the goal is to make it as much like that as possible. Certainly, the quality should never be to the point where people can't hear what's going on or um, they're distracted. You don't want people to be distracted by poor timing in the video editing or jump cuts or like things like that um, because people are used to seeing really high quality video. Now on the other hand, now you have a lot of guerrilla vi uh, video out there so I think maybe people are a little more forgiving than even some years ago um, but still it's easy to see when things are not like just so in a video. It's easier for people, especially executives, to find something in the video that they don't like because it turns out that CEOs never <laughs> look at my documentation, but they look at the video. If they don't like something, they are quick to say, oh, you know, it just sounds a little too whatever here, or you sound bored, or, you know, so <laughs> then you have to go and redo it. So, um, so again, it's like because it's more likely to be viewed, um, you're more likely to have late-breaking edits and changes. Yeah, then come do the voice. <laughs> 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 oh, if only. We, but you got to make it look easy. It's really important. Um, people you never knew cared become reviewers of, of, for every video. Um, but there are strategies to combat that. Um, the first one is, you know, just have excellent quality. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how to get really good quality and how to even help, you know, w improve the perceived quality, even if you have a problem with recording or something like that. I'll talk a little about that. Um, and then you need to have an impeccable process. So that just means um, you want to make sure that your script gets reviewed by anyone who might complain about the wording later. Uh, you want to make sure that if you know your manager hates a certain type of voice, like doesn't like the British accent, that you don't, you know, use that. In the, you know, right? So uh, you know, some of it is just to make sure that enough people sign off at and look at the the stuff you do initially. You can even do prototypes, you know, if you're doing a screen cam and you have an expensive voiceover, you only have limited access to the system, you know, you can do a prototype and pass that by someone. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to try to get buy-in before you spend a lot of time and money on it. Um, and then I, the most important one is probably just to have like meticulous production hygiene. And by that, I mean, you know, with documentation, obviously you want to, if you're building graphics or images, you want to save every component of them. So, you know, the, the raw image before you edited it and, you know, the Adobe Illustrator version and the Photoshop version and the whatever. So you're going to do the same thing, but only it's like even more stuff. So I uh, just get a lot of storage and, um, you know, have uh, most of you guys are probably like super into organizing things, I'm sure, um, because that's why you do documentation. But, um, you know, just to have like it so that you can find all the pieces to one project, even if you have to go back to it a year later. Um, and I think that's probably not so hard for people that have been writing docs for a while. But when I hire people, I always have to try to tell them like it's super, super important because you may be called on to edit this thing later. Okay, so one of my favorite advice that I ever got when I was doing video production was from the Rockport Film and Video Workshops. I went there one summer and um, I was learning directing and this, uh, this man who was teaching us said, I guess he was like the director of the whole workshops, but he said, um, he said the most important job of the director of, of movies and videos is to answer questions because the crew will come up to you and they'll say, you know, should I have this light or that light? Should they wear this hat or that hat? And they'll ask you all these detailed questions. 
And he said, the most important thing to remember is that you have to keep it germane. And I'd never really heard that word, so I was like, what in the world is that? And um, so it means relating to a subject in an appropriate way, um, being at once relevant and appropriate, uh, fitting. So uh, what he meant was when somebody comes up to you as the director and says, um, should I use this light or that light? You have to think about the story and what it's trying to accomplish and which light makes more sense with the end goal. So um, I find that actually really useful too with videos. And um, so in the spirit of sharing our failures, also I won't call it a failure, but um, we did, for a while we were doing release notes in a video format and we, and we were doing some silly ones. Um, so there was a great one that was like a limerick. It was hilarious. So, um, and actually people really liked that, but the one we did after that had um, like a pirate theme. Pirates have nothing to do with business intelligence. So I think that was a little confusing for people. So, you know, uh, live and learn, the germane thing, it really applies to video documentation, probably even more so, because you're trying to communicate like an actual, you know, how-to or an actual concept. So um, I have another video that I'll show you um, that that same uh, coworker did that, um, that hit the mark completely. And, and it's also fun, but it's very appropriate to what we're trying to convey. Okay, so now we'll get a little in the details um, about audio quality. So to me, audio is the P0 of video production. Um, and the reason I say that is because surprisingly, even if your video is blurry or imperfect in some way, if your audio is perfect, it will seem like of a higher quality than if it's not. And you know, because you're trying to communicate something, really the audio quality is probably the most important thing. It's really common to have videos where the audio is fuzzy or it's sort of too low and you turn it up, it doesn't sound right. Um, that's like a dead giveaway that the, the video is like, was made in a hurry or by someone that didn't fully understand the tool. Um, so, you know, the first thing is you wanna have the right microphone. So uh, learn mic pickup patterns. So there's like omnidirectional would be like, it picks up. So this is the microphone, this is like the front part. Uh, omnidirectional would pick up equally from all sides. So like if you're in a movie shooting outdoors and you want to get the sound of the birds and the traffic and everything, you, you use that. Um, a shotgun mic is what they use in sitcoms. It's like you sometimes see it dip into the screen if it, they've uh, not had a better cut where that didn't happen. Um, so they can have the mic be far away from a person and point it at their mouth and it will pick up their voice and nothing around it. Um, that is not a great choice actually for video documentation because um, if they move their mouth just a little away from the mic, you'll lose them. So actually I recommend uh, cardioid is probably the appropriate mic for most of what you'll be doing. Um, and that's this pickup pattern here where it picks up a little bit of the ambient noise, but not too much. Um, so it's mostly, uh, you know, wherever it's pointed at is mostly what it picks up. Um, and you wanna pick the right location to record, ideally the same location every time. Because again, if you have to go back and edit that audio in a month, you know, hopefully you can have the same human being and the same location and the same microphone, and then you'll be able to match it up uh, well. It'll never be perfect, but you know, it'll be good enough, nobody will notice. Um, you wanna use a good microphone. The, these are just two that I've used with success. There are tons of good ones out there, but these are very inexpensive. And the top one there is what I use for screen cams. And it's a cardioid um, headphone mic. The only problem is, you know, for hygiene reasons, we have like everybody has to have their own. Uh, but you know, the, it's like I don't know, twenty-eight dollars, something like that. Uh, and it has excellent sound quality. I've had really good luck with it. Um, you have to play around with where the microphone is placed, you know, and make sure that it's not picking up like S's and P's. But you can see that, you know, on the recording as you're recording it. Um, and then the one below is a lavalier microphone. That one's been really good for, um, you know, if I'm at a sales training and someone wants to record the speaker, it hooks into their, um, their phone and you just do voice recording and you can uh, have them wear that and also do the WebEx recording. But sometimes the lav mic is better and then I just lay that over, you know, instead of the other audio, we use that one, but you want both so you know how to match them up uh, when you're editing. Um, that, that's also a great solution if you want to um, score a baseball game. <laughs> One time we forgot our iPad to score my son's baseball game, so my husband did a, a voice recording and we scored it later, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> it's just nice to have tools around, right? Yeah. 
Um, so the, and probably the most important thing actually about audio is to set the levels properly. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of people have never been taught how to set levels. It's not that hard, but um, if you don't know how to do it, you know, look it up online. I'm sure there are like tons of awesome videos on YouTube about it. Um, you, so that's actually the part on the right there. So learn to set an audio level properly. You'll have to go, that all I had was a max, you know, if you guys use PC, it's going to look a little different. But you have to go into the like control panel for audio, make sure the right source is selected. There's a different one for output and input. Um, you usually adjust the level there, see there's a slider bar. Um, but then you need to, as a second step, go in your application. The screenshot at the bottom is supposed to show that. Um, go into your application, press record, start reading from the script, use the same script you will use because it will match more. And, and watch, you know, those little colored bars. You want it to be as high as possible in the green. It's okay if it goes in the yellow a little, never the red. So if it's hitting the red at all, back off a little bit, uh, you know, on the, the volume of the input coming in and uh, try again until you get it where it's like, you know, hitting in the yellow when you're at the loudest parts. Um, and then on the left part, understand the difference between mic level and line level. That's mostly important if you're recording to a camera. You may, um, the camera may require line level audio, but your mic may only give mic level audio, particularly if it's not powered, if it doesn't have a battery in it, that's a pretty dead giveaway that it's mic level. Um, so it needs some kind of mic preamp. So sometimes uh, there's a box you go through to amplify it before going to the camera. Just, I, I'm not like an expert, nor am I going to explain that completely, but I just want you to know it exists because if you have that problem, you'll know what's doing it. You know, if you can't get the, the level high enough, no matter how much you boost the volume, it's probably actually a um, amplification problem. Mm -hmm. Sound effects and music. Um, there are tons of sources for free and cheap sound effects and music, as you know, but just because they're easy to find does not mean that they are good. Um, quality matters a whole lot when you're choosing music and sound effects. Um, you don't have to pay for those things, just make sure what you choose is good. But if you're looking through a free library, it's going to take time. You know, so this is a great job for an intern. <laughs> You'll listen to these 600 musics and find five that sound decent. Um, you know, a lot of them will sound horrible. You'll know right away, probably. I mean, this is kind of by intuition and by taste. You can usually choose something appropriate. Don't be surprised if it takes two hours to find a good music track. It just takes time. Uh, but once you find a provider you really like, that's awesome, and you can usually use them over and over again. Um, music can hide issues with your audio. So if you have like some background hum or something like that, and you have no other choice, you can try putting music under it. Just make sure it's germane to what you're trying to um, communicate. But um, you know, so it can be used in that way. Um, so, and just a little tip, if you are editing um, audio and you need to cut out a little section of the audio, insert time. So we always, always record the audio separate from the screen cam. Um, and it's just so much easier. It's surprisingly difficult to read from a script and do the thing in the product and have the timing be anything like proper. So you're better off just recording, you know, reading right off the script and then separately doing the video. But when you do that, there are going to be times when, oh, I need more time to show this. And, the, uh, you know, so you have to insert blank space um, into the audio track. And when that happens, just um, instead of leaving blank space there, you should find a part in the audio recording where nothing is happening and cut out that little sliver and <coughs> insert it in there of, of just white background noise. Um, because it makes it sound more smooth. Otherwise, it's surprisingly jarring. Um, oh, and I didn't talk much about the room that you record audio in, but I will say, so we have, we just recorded in a conference room. We have a bunch of little conference rooms there, but we actually, one, one of the people on my team discovered that the best conference room for recording is the one where they store all the junk from the kitchen. So like all the extra la napkins and food and stuff. And I'm like, why is that one better? And she said, well, there's not so much echoing. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so brilliant. So now we always reserve that one when we want to record the audio. Even with that you know, headset mic, you still can tell the difference. Um, and so when we record the audio separately, we use Adobe Audition. Audition. Um, there may, so every tool that I'll, I'll mention, a lot of the tools we use just to give you some specifics. I don't know if they're the best ones. I haven't looked around in a while. There could be better stuff. You know, at the end, if you know something better, please share with everybody. 
Um, so I'm not saying that's the only tool or the best tool, it's just what we've been using. It's working good for us. Um, you know, you want to mix using the right levels. So for sound effects and for music, it takes some time to get the levels right to where it sounds right. Um, you probably will need to, um, look, oh look, I have two, I have it there twice, how funny. Um, so you probably need to test on multiple delivery methods if you're using sound effects and um, music, music especially. Um, test it on cheap headphones, test it on the built-in speaker, test it on, if you have a Mac and a PC, test it on both just so you have an idea of how it sounds. Because a lot of times it sounds fine one place, but then when they listen on the speakers, they can't understand it at all because the music's too loud. Um, so, and you know, that's partly also a generational thing. I don't like the music as loud as some younger people like it. You know, it's like, so you, you had to play around with it a little bit to see what actually works. And you know, just split the difference as far as taste goes there. Um, yeah. Maybe test it on external speakers if you think that's what people will be using. It's probably a less likely thing. Um, so video quality is actually, I think, a little bit simpler than audio quality. Um, the main things to watch out for are, of course, blurriness. Um, you know, make sure everything's in focus. If it's um, the, the resolution of the screen and the monitor you take your screen cams on is really important. Um, I don't even, I haven't made many of these lately, so I can't, I don't even know what the right stuff is, but I have my team, whenever they discover something works, like write that down and share it with everybody. So, um, because you don't want to have to figure out what resolution should I be recording at every time you sit down at Camtasia. Um, actually, at Camtasia, I use the default resolution, but I like literally spent some hours freaking out because I did not realize the default resolution, um, <coughs> it's made so you can zoom in on stuff in Camtasia. So I was trying to sample it down and do all this weird stuff, but no, the default resolution is actually probably pretty good if you're using Camtasia. Um, and use that zoom in because it's really effective to be able to zoom in and still have a clear picture uh, when you're trying to show how to do something. Um, so, you know, obviously low lighting, if you do video that involves light, you got to make sure there's enough light on the thing. It's always more than you think. Um, outside or window is probably the best. Um, I won't go into lighting temperature too much, but you can't use like a halogen light plus the window because one's blue and one's orange and it looks weird. So, um, you know, if, you're, if you get heavily into lighting, you want to learn a little bit about it. Um, and then the other thing in video, I think that, that's difficult, is like poor timing. The audio isn't timed with the picture or there's too much of a lag between sentences. It's, it's really common that when I review a video someone else has produced, I'm like, oh, cut out half the time between each sentence, you know, because it has to roll along, but people have to also be able to parse what's going on, understand it. So it's a little bit of intuition too with the timing. Um, some people are quite good at it just naturally. Um, so we use Camtasia for screen cams. Uh, there's another one too that I think um, shows every keystroke as you type it. Camtasia may do that now too. So you know there are different screen cam recording and depending on what you're trying to do, uh, one or another may be better. Um, try the default resolution first and see how that works before you mess with it. Um, and you know use the zoom in, it works really well. Um, we use Camtasia also for editing audio and video pretty commonly because if you're just doing simple cuts, it's very, you know, it does everything you need. You don't have to necessarily learn Adobe Premiere, um, but if you're doing, I'll show you an animation we made. Uh, we used Adobe After Effects for that. So if you need like a, you know, a lot of effects, you're moving around keyframes and pieces on the screen, you, you probably need something a little more heavyweight. But just for a screen cam, Camtasia works fine. So, the, so I'm sorry, I've been going like super, super fast because unfortunately I have like so, so much to say, but let me pause for a moment. Does anybody have any questions before I proceed? I've got one, if anybody else, nobody else is. You were talking about mapping data topics. You've got concept, task, reference. Yes. In the case of tasks, which involve steps, how do you reconcile the problem with the, at least the potential problem? that as a user, I've got a number of steps flying by in a serial access medium, I'm scribbling on a post-it, trying to record the steps. I mean, I would think it, you know, like some complementary relationship between print and, and tasks would be the ideal. But yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And I think that's one reason we decided to do those short videos only for the end users. Their tasks are very simple and the workflow does not involve multiple screens. It's typically like, hit this button, 
tell where you want the line to appear and that's it, right? But, so, but to actually in that case, the written word is harder. Look for the little icon in the upper right side of the screen. You know, so like actually in that case, the video is more efficient and faster to learn, but it's, we never want to give them so much that they can't remember the steps. Mm -hmm. So that's why we usually only do very simple, you know, one minute long kind of things there. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a big issue in terms of, I've been frustrated by, I need yeah. to learn how to do something and I've got multiple steps whipping by. Yes. I'm playing with the pause button and scribbling over here and trying to type with stuff, you know. Yeah. So just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on it. Yes. We do a lot of videos that are short for the reasons you're talking about, but we have some products in our in our line or whatever that have complex conceptual stuff. Do videos lend themselves to that in certain cases, or is that better addressed via written? Or do you have any opinions? So we, we've done that, and typically we have tried to convey a maximum of like three ideas per video. That seems to take about three to four minutes. I'll show you an example of um, an animated video we did that was to try to get people to understand that the search paradigm in our product is a little different than Google, even though we marketed it that it's just like Google, but it's a little different, so you can't type what is the. Um, so we wanted to convey that because sometimes people wouldn't have someone who was a regular user sitting with them when they first went in there. Uh, so I'll show you that one, and that's a good example, I think, of a concept that works in that format. Yes? Do we record the audio first or the video first? Ah, do we record the audio first or the video first? I've seen people do it both ways. I personally like to record the audio first so I have a feel for the timing when I do the video because hopefully then I won't have to edit it as much. Um, but that said, there tends to be a ton of editing. So to make the video look smooth, typically you have to really match up the timing to what the person's saying. And there could be like a hundred edits in a one minute video. Um, the also weird things happen like um, a tooltip pops up that you're not talking about, so you have to cut that out, you know, so there's a lot of sort of massaging it. But I like to do the audio first, but I've seen people do it the other way. So if, if they do the video, do, do they, do you record the audio from that part as well to help you line up the other audio? I have not even tried to make the match. I have not even tried because, you know, you could watch the video while you're recording the audio, but I like to just read the script and, you know. I don't even try. I just do it all in editing. Eventually, you get fast. So uh, yes. What do you use for animations? Um, so we use Adobe After Effects. Um, the one I'll show you is actually hand-drawn drawings. Uh, so wait, we have a cartoon artist on staff full time. We're very lucky in that, um, and she gave the. Um, the editor specified what keyframes he needed, and he animated everything in between them. So she really only had to do like whatever, 20 drawings, and then he animated the rest of it off of those 20. So, you know, it's, it's a lot like doing, you know, real computer animation in that, in that case. Yes. So I record mm -hmm. the script first, the audio, and then it's really simple to adjust clip speed with the video, or to use still images if you're settled on a particular image as your narration is moving along. So I find, it's, for me, it's always easier to do audio first and then match up the video based on your script. What do you use? Do you use Camtasia? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so thank you. So you just mentioned clip speed, which is a really good uh, feature to mention. That is one of the ways that we cheat to get the audio and video to match up is we use clip speed extensively. Um, sometimes we compress it so much that people are like, how can they type that fast? You know, but um, you know, sometimes it's what it takes to get it to match. So anybody else? I yes. Just wanted, clip speed is where you, is that where you take out gaps in the, in the uh, No, you can actually um, compress it to speed it up and everything yeah. happens, but much faster within right. that little, and you can do some fun stuff with that. I'll show you an example of uh, another experiment that we did with, with, uh, it was just a whiteboard talk, but we sped it up and it makes it kind of fun. It works both ways. You can also slow it way down. Yeah. Your narration yeah. is dragging on compared to the action on the screen. So mm -hmm. depending on what you need. You can speed it up or slow it down to match the audio. 
Yeah, if you have to slow it down too much, that's a great time to zoom if it's germane to what you're talking about because it gets boring. That helps it not to get boring. Well, I've seen a lot of interesting things where they go very fast. Right. Yeah. Like it's just purposely they go very fast. You know that they're not <laughs> yeah, yeah. doing it. But, but it, it, it avoids a lot of tedium. Yeah, yeah, it does for sure. It's, especially if they're just typing or someone's drawing on a board. A lot of these days, even in talk radio and, and uh, podcasting, they have this stuff running in the background. NPR has it running in the background just to cut out unnecessary pauses between oh, sentences yeah, yeah. And, and so forth so they can squeeze more stuff into their time. Yeah, so we're evolving to be able to understand things faster because of that. Right. And, you know, it's you can get away with a lot more speed and velocity in that than, than you used to be able to, which is nice. Yes. We were talking earlier about kind of UI and UX explanation when there's a, a big screen of something like an ERP app where you don't know exactly where the user is clicking. And you kind of have to say, up in the top right on the gray bar, click support. And then down the, you know, on the, on the orange bar here, this is where I'm going. Um, how much of that do you find that you need to put in the videos to? Because, I mean, I see users. Um, kind of assuming the knowledge that they have of the, of the interface already and they go so quickly that people have to pause their videos mm -hmm. to watch it. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think partly because what, what we're doing with our videos is simple enough. Mm -hmm. We do all of that by zooming in. Uh, we'll just say, you know, click the start icon, but then we'll like zoom into it mm -hmm. and then zoom back out and resume. So we don't say where it is, but we show it. Now, there, the whole, I'm not talking anything about like accessibility in this talk, but you know, if, if it's something your company cares about or needs to do, you've got to consider that. I have no good answer here. Um, there are probably softwares that can pull out, you know, well, if you have this, the script, that can help. Mm -hmm. um, there are softwares that can pull out audio and make that as subtitles. Um, but if you have the script, that might be even better because then you know it's at least going to be accurate. Um, so, you know, what we do is we just have the transcript showing on the page where the video is. I'll show you what it looks like. Okay. Um, and you can toggle it on and off. Thanks. Anybody else? Just one quick comment. You talked about recording in the kitchen supplies cabinet. Mm -hmm. I've seen people get a large cardboard box and line it with foam. Yep. Oh, and that's it's open awesome. on one side and they sit inside that and it completely captures the deadness of sound. That and is that awesome. You can do different rooms and, and they, you can have yeah. the same quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is good. And, you know, well, no, and we all have open offices now, right? So there's like no space. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's it's a challenge. Other questions? All right, so different types of video documentation. I'll show you ex examples of some of these. Um, so, you know, you have like actual movies. I'll show you like a short movie that they made uh, for our product launch or for our company launch. Um, and then animations, which we use for concepts. Um, you could do screen tabs, cams, um, you can do a video of a chalk talk. I'll show you an example that's not a great example, but you can see sort of how you can play around and try to make that interesting. Um, recorded webinars, you know, it, it, sometimes that's the most effective thing. Certainly if you have an expert that you can't get, just recording them doing the webinar is sometimes the best, you know, the best that you can get that person to record something for you. Um, generated playback is something kind of experimental that uh, one of our new employees has done that I'm going to show you at the very end. It's really interesting. Um, they can generate a video playback of the customer's own data and how they built that chart, even though we weren't there. It's totally freaky, but I'll show it to you at the end. Um, it's kind of magical. I don't know how he did it, so um, <laughs> you know, but it's neat, so I'm going to show it to you. Uh, and product walkthroughs. So we're experimenting with this software called WalkMe that uh, allows you to do, you know, click here, click there. Um, I've tried to stay out of that project because the QA on it is so difficult. But, you know, we have some people with a lot of energy who are taking it on. So. <laughs> okay, so I'll show you a few examples and I'll try to keep it to things that are just three minutes or so. Um, this uh, is, it's called ThoughtSpot Freeze Your Mind. This one's on YouTube. Um, this I love this video so much. Every time I like come across it or think of it, I'm like, I have to play the whole thing. Um, but it's it was for our company launch. Um, and then I'll tell you at the end like what it took to get this done, how much money the company we used, and so on. So hopefully it's not super loud. I'm Kula, resided all the workers, named Waiting on report 
after report. Endlessly. Complacence with a life full of weight. Except Tom 222 from sales, who yearned for something more. He wondered what it would be like on the hundredth floor, for he had heard you could choose your own names. Tom 1 from Marketing and Tom 101 from Operations told Tom 222 to quit his Tom Fool. He'll never be a Jack or a Liam or some multi-syllable sounding French name. Until one day, Tom 222 had to do the unthinkable, a report needed in minutes. Tom reviewed all his business intelligence products for answers, receiving the usual responses. Two weeks. Might as well be a year. With Tom's job on the line, the pressure's off. The voice whispered words that would burn forever in his mind. Many are called, but few are chosen. <laughs> like the mythical Phoenix, Tom 222 has risen from the ashes of the Tongs to now emerge as Jean Luc Francois. <laughs> All right, so I had nothing to do with that video. Anand Raghavan, who is our director of product management, um, he, it was all him, one guy. Um, it is an awesome video, I think. Um, it, uh, let me just close this so it doesn't continue. Okay. Um, but I'll talk to you a little bit about what it took to make that. So um, the... The group that made that video is called Gorilla Wanderers. They're out of San Francisco, so you guys can all hire them. Um, they, uh, the cost for a video like that would be in the range of thirty to forty thousand dollars. It's expensive. It took them, I don't know, five days of shooting to make it. They provided. They wrote the script. They provided the storyboards, the actors. You know, so they had a casting call. Like, it, you know, it's like a big production. It's like a little movie. Um, they provided the equipment, which they mostly rented. They rented cranes. I mean, it was totally crazy. They, they shot it in our office. That's all like in our office. Um, they, you know, you can see they had effects. They had rotoscoping, you know, so like a really big post-production. Um, so, you know, it's a really big uh, production. And uh, sound effects, music. Um, we provided a producer, this guy Anand, and the location. That was more or less it. I mean, obviously, he supervised. He was there on site with them day and night, you know, over the long weekend when they filmed it. And um, he supervised the edit and all that kind of stuff, but really acted as a producer and not so much a hand on, hands on uh, video person. Um, it pro he estimates that it took about two months end to end to, to get that done. So, where'd you get all those old Macs? They brought them. So, you know, that's the beauty of outsourcing to, you know, it's expensive, but they procure all that stuff. You know, they brought that old water cooler. None of that stuff was in the office. So uh, it's, it's pretty entertaining. And my kids like it because they, they are in the office from time to time and they're like, I can't believe it's the same place. When did you shoot 
shoot that video? That was shot in, let's see, we launched the company in 2014 October. So that was shot in like September. Probably. Okay, so for the next example, this is, um, this is called How Search Works. This video is the one that's meant for people that have never used ThoughtSpot and it's meant to reset sort of how they approach it. Um, so I'll play that and then I'll explain how we made that one. You can think, think of ThoughtSpot as a search engine like Google that creates tables and charts like Excel, but with all your latest company data, plus sharing and collaboration with the people in your company. It's incredibly powerful and easy to use. So here are some tips to get you started. When you log in for the first time, you'll see the search bar. It seems simple enough, but you may be wondering, okay, what can I type? Well, take a look at your keyboard. That's right, letters and numbers, basically. Give it a try. There, there, it's okay. Maybe I can help. Try thinking of search this way. When you search for a book online, you don't type, find me all books by Lewis Carroll with Alice in Wonderland in the title. You type, Carol, Alice. That's how ThoughtSpot works. So instead of, what was revenue for fruit carts in Brooklyn for the fourth quarter? You'll type revenue cart Brooklyn Q4. To start your search, think about the kinds of information you want to find and how you want to narrow it down. For example, if you just wanted to look at sales for one fruit like strawberries, you type strawberries. You can even get fancy by making ranges, doing calculations, and combining things. You can make almost any search you can think of as long as the data exists. As you type, suggestions appear. So type slowly and use the suggestions. Tables and charts appear as you type. You can select the things you want to see and remove the things you don't. Change the chart so it shows your data in a way that makes sense to you. Only you can see your answer until you get it just the way you like it. Then you can share it with other people. That's all you need to get started. Go ahead, don't be shy. And if you don't get the result you expect, no harm done. It's easy to try something else or change your mind. Get to know your data well so that all your searches can be fruitful. Yeah. All right, so, so that one actually appears in the product quite a bit as a way to try to get people who are having trouble to, uh, you know, to reset how they're looking at it. So there are like, I think three major ideas in that. So there's like, it's not plain language search or natural language search. Um, play around with it, no harm. People don't see what you're doing, you know, like basically like <coughs> mess around with it to learn how it works. Don't be nervous about it and um, what was the other one? Oh, filters, How fil you know, what filters do. Um, the awesome thing about that video is it has like amazing shelf life. So that was made over a year ago. The product's completely changed since then. Like the UI is completely different, but there's no screen cam in there. There's no picture of the UI. Um, so, it get, so if you do animations, obviously because of the mm -hmm. amount of work, you wanna make sure that it's, you're gonna somehow get some life out of that thing. Um, so that one was produced in-house. Um, one writer slash voiceover, guess who? Uh, one artist, our, our um, staff artist, and then one editor and animator who was like a brand new hire. I think he did this in like his first two weeks there, plus he learned After Effects. Like, oh my gosh, it's true what they say about these uh, the people out there now. There's just some great talent in the area. So, so that's been awesome. And I'll talk a little bit about hiring for this too and sort of what my experience has been with that. Um, we used Adobe Audition to record the audio and mix in the music and sound effects. Um, and we used Adobe After Effects for animate. It's just better for animation. It's you can do more stuff, but it's a lot. It's a bigger learning curve. Um, it took about two weeks from end to end to do that one. Okay, now this one is a more of a traditional screen cam kind of thing. Um, I made this earlier this week, uh, and this was, we were changing our, our JIRA implementation a little bit. So
So we wanted to train people how to use the new like customer priority field and stuff like that. And I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's six minutes, but I'll, I'll skip through and play part of it. Using Jira. Let me start part of the way through. Sometimes it doesn't like that. There. Let's say you want to make a feature request for a pivot table. Do a Jira search to see if the issue already exists. Yep, here it is. Editing a Jira issue. Now that you've found pivot table, you want to add a new customer as a requester of this feature. Find the customer field. The default setting is internal if no customer has requested the feature. Add the name of the customer who requested this feature. There can be multiple customers. It is extremely important to hold down the command key when adding the name of the customer. Don't you love Jira for that? If there is that? a customer already selected, you will overwrite it if you do not use the command key. If the priority is higher than the existing customer priority on the ticket, Actually, I wanted to show you this one part of this where, um, just to show you how you can sometimes have fun with stuff. Select the issue type. Bug is for problems or issues. Feature is for new feature requests or enhancements to existing features. The other issue types are only used within engineering and product management. Type in the summary, which is the title of the issue. People will search on this title and it appears in reports so take a moment to write something specific and brief that describes the issue well. In the description, type more details about the issue. For a bug, describe how to reproduce the issue. That is, what exactly do you have to do to get it to happen again? If you can, include where the bug was found, links to the affected pin board, instructions on getting the log file, or anything else that will help in assessing what is wrong. For a feature request, include what the feature is and a sentence or two about the use case and why it is important. You should attach or link any notes, specifications, trace logs, or screenshots that will help people understand what is being asked for. Try to keep multiple issues in separate tickets. If you're tempted to throw in another small bug, take the time to make a separate ticket for it. If the issue is coming from a customer, set the customer price. Okay, so I just wanted to show that one to show that, you know, even small ways that you can add like a little interest or humor because it's a, it's, let's face it, it's a pretty boring video there. And plus we're trying to enforce behavior, you know, everyone's familiar with this scenario, right? So, um, but you know, there are like little things you can sometimes do to just make a little more fun for people. Um, that was produced in house, one person, uh, Adobe Audition for audio Camtasia for the screen cam and all those little call outs where it puts the URL and where it says like press the command key, those are all just Camtasia. Um, you know, could it have been something even more beautiful? No, but you know, sometimes you just want to get it out there quickly and that's just fine. This is just an internal facing video. Um, uh, one and a half days for the script and the recording and the edit. Okay, so I'm going to show you this one too and the, the video quality is horrible, so I appreciate, I. Uh, Apologize for that, um, but I'm not showing it so you can see how to do awesome video because this we did early days and it wasn't lit properly, etc. I should I did it when it was just me and I should have had someone help me with the focus as well. Um, but I'm just going to show you part of it to show how you can kind of have fun with something as simple as a um, whiteboard talk. Hi, I'm Alicia. This talk is about the history of business intelligence, or BI. Since not everyone comes to ThoughtSpot with the same background, this talk will help you understand the history of our space. Starting in the 1950s and 60s, data was stored in mainframes. Business users didn't have access to the data in mainframes. Only programmers could run reports. So that one actually... Um, Server, Informix, and others. They were called relational databases because they stored the data in tables. 
made up of rows and columns, and the tables are called relations. Business applications store data in these databases. Okay, so that one was is like training for new employees who might not be familiar with the space. Um, was produced in house. One person should have been two. Would have had better uh, quality of the video there with two people. Um, we used Adobe Premiere to edit that one, and it took about uh, two days altogether. So, um, but I only show it like because it's just like another approach. It's just a little different, trying to make something that could be boring into like a little bit more interesting. You can play with the speed there. You notice that sometimes I cut from a wide angle to a, you know, and obviously I only have one camera. So, you know, can try to like hide that so you don't see the lip moving right then um, and that kind of stuff. Okay, so how do you choose which one to use? Um, you know, obviously cost and time to produce are really important. Definitely consider the shelf life. If you're gonna show part of the product and it's about to change the entire UI, just know you're gonna have to record that over again. Um, ease of updating, so, um, you know, obviously anything where you've got a camera on a person is going to be really hard to update. You just can't go back in later and, you know, cut in and they're just going to look different. I don't care who you are. So, um, you know, and of course you can do things to get around that. You can put up a screen for that part where you have to do the voiceover again or whatever, but um, distribution, so, um, <coughs> what, why does that have to do with it? How do you choose distribution? Don't know. Um, but in, it also has to be uh, germane, obviously. Like, you know, it's nice if you can choose a, a modality for how you want to um, create it based on the people that are going to use it and, and um, what they're trying to do and what the most appropriate way is to deliver that message. Um, so am I running out of time? I'm so sorry, you guys. I like, as I started writing down, I was like, this is going to be so much longer than an hour. But um, do, do you guys, should I speed through? What should I do? Yeah. It's up to you. We have the room, so, you know. Okay. okay. If people have to leave, I won't be offended. Mm -hmm. I will look at, hope it's not me. Um, updating and translation. Obviously, you have to save all your source material. Always have a written script. Um, keep a spreadsheet so you know what all the video is that's out there so that if something changes, you know what it affects. Um, and also, uh, so yeah, you may have to redo every video in your library if a button changes. Um, and for a translation, you'll have to deal with the script, the audio recording, and the visual, so it's just a little bit more involved. Um, building a video producing team. Um, hiring just got easier, so for people who have to hire for documentation, I have had a incredibly hard time hiring, especially like new grads to do documentation, just people don't want to do it. But if they can also do some videos, it's very easy to get people interested in it. Um, this is a great project for interns too, especially if you're just moving into videos because um, sometimes they may already have some expertise in it just from editing videos for fun. Um, and if it's, you know, where the thing doesn't have to be delivered, but if they do a bang up job, it's great for, you know, it looks great for them. And um, it's also something they can take with them when they leave. So I always pitch it to the interns like, hey, when you leave, you can take this video with you and show it in interviews and they love that. Um, there is a ton to learn, but it can be learned. Even if you get people with no experience, they can learn it. Um, have the team members learn how to do the different softwares and teach each other, because that's a great way to reinforce their learning. Um, helps with team building, and it's just like less work for you. Um, and then I have my team document everything. I, they have, um, I, I like to, <laughs> I got this from Arlie Lewis, who hired me at Aster. And uh, he documented everything, so when he left, I knew how to do everything, which was awesome. So I had them do this. I just have, you know, uh, the procedure. They document the procedures for everything we do internally, especially video production. So if we have someone else has to do it, they know how. Hiring for video documentation. Um, decide what exactly you want before you try to hire, and then you can hire for those skills. There are typically two buckets these people fall into if you hire someone just for video. Um, one is video producer. That person manages video strategy and projects, writes scripts and storyboards, hires contract production crews, chooses music, sound effects, manages budgets, supervises shoots and edits section, sessions. So, you know, like what Anand, the role that he played in that, um, uh, the movie one. Example, um, their skills would be like script writing, producing project management, logistics, scheduling, uh, offline video editing, um, and they should have a network of service providers that they can tap into that they worked with before. Um, 
So, and then videographer is a slightly more junior position, but in many cases, the person you'll actually want, unless you're doing content marketing. Um, and they would create in-house videos, they're more hands-on, they would buy or rent equipment, set up lighting, operate camera, record audio, um, you know, hopefully they can do voiceover too, um, edit the audio and video themselves. And um, their skills are more like hands-on video production. Um, if you're doing, you know, video that requires lighting and camera, they need to know that. Um, and video editing. So there, there are two very distinct roles. So I would encourage you to think closely about which one you want. Most people will say both. Sometimes you can find these both in one person, sometimes not. Um, but the good news is typically um, videographers are, salary requirement is not as high as documentation writers. So hopefully if you don't need someone with a ton of domain expertise in your software, um, you can find somebody really good, um, you know, coming out of a video uh, program at school uh, in college or something like that. Um, infrastructure for if you want to shoot video, um, DIY video studio, that, that spreadsheet is we got a little video sp studio for $500 um, off of what they recommended on Wistia. So um, it's pretty easy to get that approved if you just want to do like talking head videos or some, you know, whiteboard kind of stuff um, and to just make it look a little more professional. Um, if your company's moving to a new office, ask for space. Um, it's ideal if you can get a room for recording audio with a PC in it that already has the right software, is already set up with a microphone. Um, include some instructions so executives can re record themselves. They would typically much rather do that so they can start over 100 times than do it in front of a group and have you record it. So sometimes that's a way to get you know, them to do the videos. Um, for distribution, user experience. So um, access and findability is really important. And for video, it's kind of, you know, you've got to figure out how that can work for you. Um, you must have video streaming, obviously, nowadays. I think it's obvious, but, you know, it's really important to have, like, good video streaming. Don't have them download a file. Don't, you know, even I don't like to put videos on Google Drive because it doesn't, it, they don't look good. They're choppy. Um, I always put them on the streaming service, even for internal people. Um, Internal versus external access. So if privacy is a concern, you'll, YouTube will not probably be a good, although I, I hear they have better support for that now. I've not looked. Um, but so that's why we used Wistia for our videos. Uh, secure, so to secure the company's intellectual property. Um, browser support may be important. Um, in product help and online documentation. We wanted to have those both in one hosted solution. So we wanted to be able to single source, not only the production side, but also the delivery side. So our in product help was coming from the exact same pages as our documentation. Uh, so we chose MindTouch for that. Um, happy to talk to anyone who wants to discuss it in more detail. I can, you know, we worked with them for about two years, um, but they allow us to do some things. We have not found any other solution that does it. Um, let's see. Uh, we also, oh, so really, really important, the last point here, keep the videos off of the product release train. It does not, it, it seems obvious to you and me that no documentation or video should be part of the product release cycle because then they have to be QA and they have to be in by a certain time and all this stuff, you can't fix a typo. Um, but with videos, for some reason, people seem to think you want to embed them in the product, you do not. Um, so I actually was happy to be able to convince them to call out to Wistia and pull those into the product when they wanted them in product instead of having them like as part of the whatever, the product software bundle. Because also they're huge, they're just huge. And every time you do a new branch, it has all those videos and it's like no good. Uh, so the documentation stack, I, I made this because I was trying to uh, explain to people what, like how we actually do this thing. So, uh, you know, this is just how we do it. I don't know if it's the best way, but, um, so this top section is data docs for internal. We use Google docs for release notes and also for just edits that are collaborative. Um, for release notes, those go to PDF, uh, which then goes to Google Drive and Ignite for customers to download. Um, we use Oxygen for the data docs, which gets output to both PDF and to CHM. Uh, CHM is a Windows help format. We only use that as an interim step. We never deliver it like that. But that's what MindTouch needs in order to take in the entire document in one import and spread it out into its pages, maintaining all the links in the image uh, embed. Uh, then we, uh, let's see, yeah, so just an interim step. Uh, for videos, we use Adobe Creative Suite uh, and Camtasia. Sometimes we just use this for the audio, which then gets edited together in Camtasia with the video. Sometimes we use it for everything, like for the animation. 
Um, all our video gets out, but the MP4 on export. Uh, then we host it all in video and uh, Wistia, so we can have the um, the streaming. And those videos also get embedded in Montouch pages, so that they can be served with our documentation and searched together. So where are those arrows coming up from the bottom? That's the second half. <laughs> I couldn't fit it all on one page. So. Um, this is in product help. So, so we do that in several different ways, and we're kind of in slugs trying to figure out what works best. Um, we have a help center, which is served out of MindTouch, so it comes directly from their single source on the distribution side. Um, then WalkMe is another thing that we, uh, some of our people have been investigating, so we may actually move to that and have that call out to the documentation on MindTouch, so that when you click question mark, WalkMe is the first thing you see, but you can also go to the doc. Um, and then we also have in product, they're called like assistants. So it's like we have a formula builder, which has a little bit of syntax uh, and like doc embed. That's embedded in the product. I have to like manually edit JSON files, so it's kind of disturbing. But, um, but you know, that's another part of the help. And then we have a replay search, which is the thing I'll show you at the very end. Okay, so searching video with documentation. Um, you can enable searching video. Uh, we do that by including the transcript within the page in MindTouch. We have a toggle that allows you, yeah, so here it is. We have, so this is a bonus with MindTouch that you get. We have this hide show transcript button, so we just like leave it off. So the transcript doesn't show by default, but they can click it to turn it on. But even though the transcript is not showing, so it's just basically um, uh, the display none, it's CSS set to display none. Still, it comes in the, so they have like a Lucene search and still it brings the video if you search on that term. So that's how we get the video and the documentation searchable all in one thing. Um, so, and just a word about Wistia, it allowed us to keep our videos private when we were in stealth mode, but we could still share them with customers by email, like individually. Um, it's great for collaboration during production. So if you have something where multiple people have to look at, um, you know, a video, make comments on it or whatever, you can use it as a tool just for your production. Um, it has excellent quality of service, it just works. It's working over a phone right now. I mean, it, it works great. Um, it's the best free video production training you'll ever find, so even if you don't ever use them, you can use their training for free. Um, how do I know if the video is working? I have just a couple of slides left. So how often does the video get played? What's the engagement? How far into the video do people watch? Wistia gives you all kinds of stats, and I'll actually show you um, what it looks like. So this is that video that we were just looking at. Um, you know, you can see where people are dropping off. You can see, this is so funny, I have like a bump here where people are watching it more. People are actually rewinding it to see what he typed. It's so <laughs> funny. So you can really see detail. You can see who went in there. You can see which parts they watched. You know, here's somebody rewinding to see that, you know, what he typed in there. So it is just extraordinary, the, the amount of detail that they provide for you. Um, so yeah, it's Wist, yeah, they, we really like them. They, they work well. I have no idea how much it costs. It's not, I don't pay for it through my budget. So, um, so and then just the last thing I want to show you is these three kind of more experimental things that we're trying to do with in-product video. Um, so these are some somewhat experimental, but they're interesting. Um, so All right, so this is our product, so our, our in-house implementation, which of course is called dog food. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so um, what I want to show you in here, so just the in-product help, so I'll show you what that looks like. So if I click question mark, I get this is actually being served from MindTouch and the videos are within Wistia. Um, but you know, I can like, so you know, uh, of course right away we want them to watch that, how search works when they first come in here. Um, but you know, we, we put more videos in there, um, we have tips and tricks, keywords, release notes are there. Um, I can even, you know, I have the clients, ODBC, JWC up there for download, you know, so it really is very flexible. I can provide a lot of stuff just on this hosted solution without having to be a, a webmaster or anything like that. Um, and then uh, I wanted to show you that we also have been experimenting with using video for help. So, like, if I start typing in here, all right, so here's what happens if there actually is something that fits. But then uh, if I type a bunch of junk in there, 
um, it will offer me the video. Are you new here? You know, watch this video. So we're like really pushing the video on people. So we want to make sure they at least watch it one time. Um, I think this has mixed results because I think it can be very jarring to see all the stuff on the screen. Plus now there's a video. So, um, so I'm not sure if this has totally worked, but it's just another, once you're making the videos, you may as well try different things with them. Um, and then this last thing I want to show you, which I think I just saw today for the first time. I think it's so crazy. Um, is that, so, you know, these charts on this pin board were made by someone typing in the bar and searching. So a way to self-train would be to see how was this chart made. So this guy, Jordy Hanel, who works, uh, he's a product manager at ThoughtSpot. He made this, um, somehow it can replay the search even on my own data, my own chart. So we don't even know what the customers are searching on or what their data is. And yet we're providing them a video of how this thing was made. It's totally nuts. There's no audio, but it's just very interesting. Okay, so we do start replay. It's going to show like how this thing was actually made. I have no idea how this thing is done. It's totally crazy. He said he used some kind of QA tool. Like okay. what they use in QA okay. to automate the, but you know, somehow he's driving it by the search itself. It's totally nuts. So yeah, so it's pretty cool. And there's also the ability to record it too. Yeah, so that's like, that's also video documentation, right? I mean, it's just a totally different approach, but pretty interesting. All right, that's, that concludes the Thank you for hanging in.